Well, good afternoon, everyone. This is Veronica Johnson, and I'm welcoming you to the Deep Dive on the Fulbright Experience, sponsored by the Southern Regional Education Board, Doctoral Scholars Program, and the Fulbright Program. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. If you could, please make sure that you're muted when you enter. And also, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, and we will have time to, to answer all questions. And this session is being recorded, and we will make that available to everyone. Um, so uh, if you think of something that you didn't um, ask during the live session, please feel free to email us at doctoral.scholars at sreb.org, and we will make sure that we get answers for you. So at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Abraham, who will introduce our speakers for the evening. Thank you, Veronica. Um, Good afternoon, everyone. It is, um, I was just saying before, all of you came into the room, so to speak, but it is great to see uh, a lot of names and faces that I haven't seen in a long time. And it uh, gives me great pleasure to see all of you and to uh, be able to spend an hour with you this afternoon. Um, I, I appreciate all of you taking the time to join us for a more intimate discussion about our Fulbright about the Fulbright experience. Uh, we're pleased this afternoon uh, to have back again, Dr. Donathan Brown, Assistant Provost and Assistant Vice President, uh, Office of Faculty Diversity and Recruitment at Rochester Institute of Technology. Uh, he is also a Fulbright alumnus whose experiences uh, were in Slovenia. We also have with us this afternoon, um, our, 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 our 2014 DSP graduate from LSU, Dr. Lenika Baptiste. She is an assistant professor of music education and is currently at the University, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Uh, her Fulbright experience was in Brazil. Uh, and we'd like to thank both of you for being with us this afternoon and for sharing your insights about the uh, Fulbright experience. Uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to Dr. Brown. All right. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this afternoon. Uh, it, it's always a pleasure when we can gather so many great minds into one room, particularly to talk about the Fulbright. Um, I want to kind of engage this as a conversation, an organic conversation, that we can get a better understanding about shared experiences and insights and advice about the application process, um, our time abroad, just in general, right? There really isn't a, a rigid format in which we're following here, but I think by having two Fulbright alums on the call, so to speak, will really give you an insight as to how each of us experienced our own Fulbright. Um, so Dr. Batiste, I would yield to you if you would like to begin with any opening thoughts or comments. Hi, um, I'm excited to be here today and share about my Fulbright experience. Thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, I was in the presentation last week and someone asked about how did you choose where you would go? And I wanted to share about how I chose. I had studied French when I was younger. So when I was looking for a Fulbright experience, I wanted to do something in a French speaking country, but nothing fit my, uh, my area. I'm in music education. So I needed something that was specifically music or that was open to all areas. The one that fit exactly where I was, was in Brazil. And initially I thought, I don't speak Portuguese. How am I going to do that? But um, I also, started thinking about it. They wanted someone who was going to study outside of Sao Paulo or Rio. And I have a friend that I did school with at LSU, who is a professor at the university in the Federal University in Recife. And I also had a very close friend who is from Recife. So I started talking with them, learning more about the area, learning about the music, and I really became intrigued with it. So instead of, I did not speak Portuguese. I'd never been to Brazil. They also wanted someone who had never been there before. So instead of looking at the limitations that I had, I tried to look at those limitations as opportunities. So not being able to speak Portuguese might've been a limitation, but I said, hey, I'll learn it. So I spent about nine months learning the language and I learned it well enough to be able to have conversations and people were very friendly there. If I didn't 
say something correctly, they say, we know what you're trying to say, and they would just go on and they would help me. And it turned out to be a really great experience. Uh, my experience differed from Dr. Brown's. We talked about, uh, about that a little bit, and that from the time I applied, between the, the time I applied and the time I got accepted, I found out I would be having a child. And I thought, how am I going to go and do this Fulbright experience with a child? Well, they were pushed it back for me. And I was able to go a few weeks after he turned one. With that, I had to choose a school for him to go to. I stayed with my friend's family. They knew people in the area. We got him there. I had to, because I had to go to events at night, I had to hire someone to watch him. I, and that gave me a different insight into domestic workers, which also worked with my community. So those things that might have been limitations, I tried to look at those as opportunities and I would encourage you to do the same. That's fantastic. And, and thank you so much for sharing that because you're right. Our experiences did differ uh, considerably, but I think there are some things that really uh, remain constant. So for example, just attempting the language. Um, as I shared in, in the last conversation, my Slovenian is not fluent, um, but I know enough in certain circumstances at least, but just a mere attempt uh, in, in various social situations and others really provided a lot of comfort for those individuals saying, you know, we know, what, we know what you're trying to say. And one person in the store said, hey, look, I understand you speak English. Slovenia is one of those uh, languages that aren't easy to learn and you can't learn it everywhere. Uh, and, and so we really give you a lot of credit for even trying. Um, so Dr. Batiste, let me ask you, uh, one of the things as, as you talked about the selection of your host country. Tell us a little bit more on the question of why Fulbright? What was behind the idea of applying for and engaging in a Fulbright experience? I believed that the Fulbright experience would work very well with what I wanted to do. The first um, Fulbright scholar that I heard speak was actually at the um, I was at the conference in Atlanta for the, um, the Compact for Faculty Diversity. And I was so intrigued there. And then my major professor, while I was working on my dissertation, did a dissertation in, uh, did a Fulbright in, um, oh goodness, don't get me lying, I can't remember where. <laughs> but she, she also did a Fulbright. And so with my interest in, so in my area of music education, I look very closely at the ways in which we approach music from cultures that are not our own. And that worked really well with what I wanted to study. And I got so much insight into that. And being in Brazil, it almost felt like being in a parallel universe. It's also an area that experienced uh, slavery. It's also an area that um, had that colonization aspect to it and just looking at the similarities between the experiences and how that impacts the music and how they use the music as a form of resistance and how the children are brought into that and, and the connections with religion and social justice it was just an amazing experience and there I looked at other fellowship programs but none of them supported what I really wanted to do with that culture that aspect diving so deeply into the culture and understanding Understanding it from that perspective. Well, that's certainly insightful, and, and I think it can prove ever so invaluable for, to those who are thinking about applying for Fulbright, what it may mean for them, what it may look like for them. I have another follow-up question, and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop with the 20 questions for you on the time being, at least. Um, talk to me about how the Fulbright experience really engaged your tenure and promotion process and criterion, because oftentimes it's one of those variables that we speak very little about, although it means so much when we think about evaluations for promotion, amongst other things. Can you at least talk a little bit about that? Yes. So where I am, it's a research one institution and publications are really highly valued here. Um, so I got an extension to be able to do more publications from the Fulbright experience. And um, also when we're having our annual meetings about that, they say, look, you did the Fulbright, put out some publications about that, you're good. Like it really bumps you up when it comes to tenure and promotion. 
Well, that's fantastic. I think our experiences were very much similar along the lines of tenure and promotion. Uh, mine operated in a similar fashion as yours. Well, you know, because for us, our criterion was national and international prominence. And so what better way to articulate and demonstrate that through an international recognition such as Fulbright. So this is very important for a lot of people to think about and a lot of people to consider uh, as they think about how Fulbright can actually propel their career to the next level. Um, let's see here. So are there any questions or comments at this point, Dr. A? It looks like you have something to say. Yeah, I do. Jonathan, in, in, in terms of your experience with that as well, did, I mean, because that Fulbright is a full, it's a full year, correct? Yeah, it varies. Uh, I did mine for a semester. Okay, so it can be, I always, I'm, I always show you how our impressions that I always thought it was a, it was a full year experience, but it can be for a semester or two semesters. Um, yep. time. Okay, I did not realize that. But so, I don't know, so I'll ask the question anyway. Did it impact, so you're, you're spending, a semester away, does that Im did that in any way impact the tenure clock in your in your case? Yeah, um, the the good part about it is that um, when I was kind of going through the Wiggum role here uh, of tenure and promotion, it didn't impact me whatsoever. I had the opportunity to stop the clock, but I chose to continue. Uh, and the reason being is that the Fulbright counted toward tenure and promotion. So why not have it count? Um, okay. So it positively impacted me and there was no need to stop the clock. Gotcha. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So other questions or thoughts as, as we kind of move forward, like I said, I just wanted to engage this as a more holistic opportunity for us to have a, a conversation about the Fulbright. Okay. Okay, it looks like I do have one question for you. Um, Dr. Batiste, in terms of timing, at what point in your career did you undertake your Fulbright? That's a good question. I did the postdoctoral fellowship. So I had to be within, was it five years of, of completing the PhD? So I finished in December of 2014 and I was initially scheduled to go in 2018, in the fall of 2018, but I left in May of 2019 and finished in October of 2019. Would, would both of you all, for because there may be some, some of those um, listeners or participants this time that don't know the different types of Fulbrights, would you, uh, would both of you just delve a little bit into that about the different types of Fulbrights that one can apply for. Yeah, sure. Dr. Batiste, if you'd like to lead off. Uh, well, I, I'm most familiar with the postdoctoral fellowship. I know that that, that was fairly, it, I, I believe it was fairly new when I started, when I went to apply for it, but you have a certain amount of time after you finish, which means that you may not have as many publications as someone who has been teaching for a longer period of time and it gives you the opportunity to build up your um, research while you are in, in doing the Fulbright experience. And I, I know Dr. Brown has a lot more insight about that and the other, and the other ones. Uh, okay. Yeah. No, well, that's certainly helpful. Um, I engaged in a Fulbright Scholars Grant, uh, which is quote unquote, uh, the traditional Fulbright route. And so here you can spend anywhere from a semester or two abroad. Uh, and in doing so, you either have research or teaching expectations. Oftentimes the Fulbright um, Scholars Grant has a heavy, heavy role to play in tenure and promotion. Uh, cases and opportunities raises amongst other things. And so that was the one I applied for. And there is also another one uh, entitled Fulbright Specialist. And, and here it's a lot shorter in length, uh, typically from two weeks to six weeks. And these are very, very project oriented, project specific uh, engagements that you and another university around the world engage in. Um, oftentimes you will see the description of the project at hand, what they seek from the Fulbright specialist, and you apply uh, directly based upon the needs of that institution.
All right. Okay, we did have one question that came in uh, via email. Mm -hmm. um, and the question is, can someone who is not full faculty, but an adjunct professor apply? And also, mm -hmm. does the application have a cutoff criteria for alumni? And um, this person says she graduated in 2009. Okay. Yeah, so there, there is no cutoff for alumni uh, whatsoever, one. And two, yes, anyone within any rank of higher ed can apply. Um, take a look at each specific category or each specific award that you're seeking to apply for, and they will give you the criterion. Uh, oftentimes, there is no required rank. Um, the only time in which I have noticed a required rank would be for the distinguished uh, professors within the Fulbright. And so these are individuals who have had their doctorates for at least 10 years uh, and who have you know, amassed a certain amount of, of research. But above and beyond that, each award is different, but they also begin to really dive into the details as to what they seek. And just a reminder, everyone, if you have any questions, please feel free to put those in the chat. And also, if you think of any other questions after we end the broadcast, please feel free to email us at doctoral.scholars at sreb.org, and we will definitely get an answer for you. So, Dr. Batiste, I know I told you I was going to lay off the 20 questions, but I'm back on to it again because I really like your experience. Talk to me about housing. Because one of the things oftentimes that goes really undiscovered or undiscussed rather uh, are the logistics. Once you're there on the ground, tell me how you worked out housing amongst other things. Okay, uh, that's a great question. I, um, I talked with a former Fulbright um, fellow and I talked with uh, people that, I, uh, that my friends knew about mm -hmm. housing and it turned out that my friend's aunts had an extra room and I just rented the master bedroom from them and it worked out really, really well. It was in a great area. I could walk to the supermarket. I got a feel for the area. They brought me into the culture, helped me to understand some things that were common there. And, and they, it, it became like a family. And that's how I found housing through, through my friend. That's great. That's great. Now, can you share with I would have, I, I want to say it would have been a bit of a challenge otherwise, but I'd also made some connections at the university and they were willing to help me with that as well. Mm. Okay. Did your award come with any sort of living stipend? Um, and it, it came with the standard amount. I didn't have anything above that. I did have something to assist with fees that I might have when I um, would need to get paperwork done for different things. But other than that, I didn't have anything extra. But what I did get was sufficient to live off of. And it, it more than sufficient for me, actually. I was even able to pay for my son's daycare out of it. The cost of living was really, really low. So it, it worked out. Um, I did want to mention something about the university, so about my fellowship award. So mine was a research award and it was teaching, but the teaching aspect of it was doing workshops on things that I had studied already. So I did workshops on spirituals, arranged spirituals. I did workshops on gospel music. I, I, was, um, I had a lot of flexibility. I started a gospel choir at the university. We had a, a concert. So those were the types of things that I did. Which I did guest lectures for different clubs. Um, I, and also from that connection, they were very excited to have someone there from another university in the United States. And so they, I got invited to another state to do a lecture out there and spend some time there and then went to another state to do um, a, a conference there and got to interact with people um, and, and actually met somebody that graduated from my undergraduate institution out there. So yeah, those are some of the things that I did. Okay, I have a few additional questions and um, one uh, announcement uh, just to remind everyone, um, this is a second Fulbright session and both of them are being recorded. Well, once we send out the information, the recordings for both of our sessions will be made available to everybody who um, joined us. 
and our next question is did the program help with language skills or did you have to learn the language on your own i had to learn it on my own i and i i could have taken a course at the university but i've taken I've taken foreign language classes and I'm sure they've evolved since then, but I had to take several years before I was able to use it. So I found a program that was conversational and it taught you how to say hello and then it, it used novellas and then it, it would show scenarios and then you would use learn how to use it. So I wasn't very good at conjugating the verbs. I didn't have a ton of vocabulary, but they knew what I was saying and that was the important thing. And <laughs> when I got back, I started doing more programs to, to really refine my ability to speak the language. I took every opportunity I could. I would fall asleep. Well, I ordered the um, Brazilian channel on the TV and I would fall asleep watching that at night. I would read as much as I could. I would listen to people talk. I would find friends. I went on websites. There's a website called Speaky where you can meet people from different countries and try and practice speaking with them. They'll correct you. You can correct them. So I tried a whole lot of different things just so I could be able to speak with people. And getting out once I was there was very important. Um, I think that sometimes in the United States, people are a bit judgmental when you don't speak English fluently. But there I found it to be very different. People were glad that I was trying to speak the language and they would try to help me. Wow. I don't, I don't want to have to answer after that because my uh, response will be seen as a slacker, but I'll go ahead anyway. Um, no, I did not have any sort of assistance prior to. Um, my development of Slovene was uh, largely uh, engaged on the ground. Um, so my approach was like Dr. Batiste, but a little bit different. Um, I would go out and actually read street signs uh, and, and try to pronounce them. I know it sounds odd, but take a look at the Cyrillic alphabet and see if you don't blame me on that one. Uh, particularly the emphasis on certain nouns and, and vowels and things of that nature. Um, but I also uh, took to an app, the name that I forget, because there's only also a few that have Slovene. Um, but I also began to engage individuals in the stores and, and around town. Um, but as I mentioned previously, that didn't work too well because once folks found out I was American who speaks English, no one wanted to speak Slovene. Everyone wanted me to help them with their English. But, you know, it was one of those things. It's a, it was a catch-22. But in the end, though, I really learned from my students um, because I asked them to say, look, I need you to teach me Slovene. Uh, and, and so every day during our classes, they would teach me a few new words and now just continue to build up on and on. Um, and, and finally, I'll say this, our department meetings, our faculty meetings were not in English whatsoever, even though I was sitting in the room. Um, it was upon me to pick it up as quickly as possible. Uh, so just trying to imagine learning Slovene in a sense of curricular conversation. It's difficult enough in English. I mean, let alone Slovene. Um, but no, I did not have any sort of preparation beforehand. Okay, next question. Um, I'm curious if you need to be a full-time and tenured faculty member to apply. No, not at all. Okay, and the next question, um, could you share the link or the application website with us? Sure. I can put it in the chat box. Uh, it's quite easy. It's CIES.org. And I just placed it in the chat box. Hopefully everyone can see it. Uh, that'll take you to Fulbright and you can learn a lot more about different categories, different awards, different time lengths, amongst other things. So feel free. Um, if I'd, I'd also like to share something else. Um, I would encourage anyone, even if you don't apply for the Fulbright, to broaden your uh, network as much as possible. When you go to conferences, meet people, talk with them. There are many people who are senior in the field, who in, your, in my field at least, and in, in fields that are related, who were more than happy to serve as mentors. I ran into a little bump at the road, in the road um, with with the application process, not with the Fulbright organization, but with the university and some assistance that I could have gotten there. And instead of saying, well, I just give up, 
I reached out to some people who agreed to serve as mentors and they read over my proposals over and over again. One of them served as one of my, um, one of my references. They really just helped, not just to encourage me, but to also make sure that everything was in order and presented as well as, as I could. So, and they were really the force behind me keeping, um, it really getting the Fulbright, I think. So I would encourage you to do that, to reach out to mentors and not necessarily those that are prescribed for you. Next question. Um, did you only apply once or did you have to be, or did you have to apply multiple times before being accepted? Um, let's see. So I did once for the Fulbright grant to Slovenia and once for the Fulbright grant to Belarus. So I'll, just one for each. I only applied once. Again, again, if you have any questions, please feel free to put them in the chat, but that's all I have right now. Quick question for both of you. Did, I mean, you, uh, Dr. Brown, you apply, you, you applied twice. I mean, can you, is, is there a limit on the number of, if you will, Fulbrights one can apply for? Yeah, I, I look at it this way. There is a cooling off period. Uh, so you cannot receive or apply for a Fulbright within a certain window of time. And I forgot what that prescribed window is, uh, six months, 12 months or something to that extent, but they do ensure uh, that you kind of have a cooling off period between awards. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Batiste, let me, let me go back to you um, because here's a question that I oftentimes think about. Um, what advice would you give someone who is thinking whether or not the Fulbright is right for them? What would you say to that person? I would say uh, learn as much as you can about the program, read all of the information there. Um, when I was looking, when I wanted to apply, there was so much information available. And then on the site, there were, um, there were people, there's a place where you can search for people who have done things of Fulbrights in your area and you can talk with them. I, I mean, you can reach out to them, you can find them. Um, so I would talk to Fulbright alum. I would learn as much about the fellowship program as possible. Like for me, I, I knew for years that I, I really, really wanted to apply for a Fulbright. So I have been researching it for years before applying, but that would be my, um, that would be my best advice, research and talk to somebody who has, um, who has done this. There's, there are also, um, I think they're called ambassadors. There are people that may come to your university that you can have. And when they came here, I had a one-on-one -on -one session and they um, talked to me about things I had not considered. Um, so just get as much information as you possibly can. Okay. have one additional question. Um, what feedback did you receive from, from Fulbright regarding why your application stood out? I don't remember, honestly, getting <laughs> that feedback, but I do know that, like, like I just said about reading really carefully, I made sure that everything they asked for, that they were looking for, I played that up about why I fit that in the application process. Every single thing that fit, someone that doesn't have experience in Brazil, I'm gonna play that up. Somebody who wants to study outside of Rio or Sao Paulo, I'm going to do that. Um, preference given to people from underrepresented populations, let me play that up. Um, and just, so I just tried to market myself as well as I could and I would also say this is not the time to be modest. <laughs> yeah, that, that's well put. I mean, the only thing I remember, and I did not receive feedback directly about my application, though uh, I did have an opportunity to meet um, the folks at the U.S. Embassy in the host country of Slovenia. And we did have a conversation about my application, and, and they were very candid to say, you know, one of the things that really stood out 
with your application is that you did not seek to go down the beaten path of the tourists. So in other words, there are so many people who apply to universities in Paris and London and other places because for different reasons, but oftentimes are viewed um, you know, as perhaps touristy reasons. Um, I decided to go off the beaten path and, and according at least to the embassy, they thought that was really novel uh, because everyone typically tries to go in one similar direction. So, so think about going outside of the major cities. Think about the opportunities that may exist in neighboring communities and neighboring countries amongst other things because there you may have the best experiences. And if you think about ways in which your application can stand out, take the feedback that I received from the embassy. Think all outside of the beaten path and look at other surrounding universities as well. I don't have any other uh, questions at this time. Oh, Veronica, I, I do have, would um, Dr. Batiste, would you comment a little bit more? I don't know if everybody else can see this, but there are all females on this call besides, besides Dr. Brown and myself. And, you know, would you, Lanika, would you go into a little bit more about the decision to take um, your child with you to a foreign country? Also, would both of you comment about whether uh, the Fulbright organization encourages one, if one's married, has a spouse, to include their spouse in the, um, in the experience? Okay, well, the decision to take my just above one year old child to a country I had never been to is I still think that it is a crazy decision and I can't. Well, I, I, that's, that's pretty bold. I would, <laughs> I would go with you on that. That's pretty bold. <laughs> I, I, the thing that made me feel more comfortable about it is that the, I knew where I was going to be staying. I was very close to, um, to this person and I knew that I would be staying with her family. They had already found, um, they had already found, uh, the the daycare i would be where i would be living we had talked we talked about a lot of things but i was still really really nervous to be honest and i'm there with a child and i barely speak the language right. so um my mother who is um a very <laughs> overprotective grandmother um she said that's crazy and she came with me she came with me the first week and um something happened the first week. He became um, ill. He had some sinus things going on. He had a little fever. So where we were staying, they, as well as their friends, they grabbed us. They brought us to the children's hospital. They stayed there with us for hours. They translated for us. They went to the back. They never left our side. They went and got us something to eat after we had been there for a long period of time. And my mother said, that one experience, let me know that you were going to be okay there. And it, it just worked out, it just worked out well, but that was crazy. One thing that, in, one interesting thing that came up was um, I, the, the performances that I went to, many of them occurred at night and they went really late. So I didn't want to bring him there and I needed to have someone to watch him. So they had a trusted family friend who was a domestic worker come and watch him. I was, um, that was a bit of a culture shock for me because the, the whole situation with domestic workers, I've never seen that or experienced that. The staying at the, well, you'll, she'll be here for 10 hours and you'll only pay her $25. Like I'm not, I, I can't do that. I, you know, it was, it, it was just a bit of a culture shock for me, but it's something that I would have never even realized existed if I didn't have him. Um, there were, um, I noticed the people that would come through and, um, oh, also at the school, they were very, very doting. Um, they, they're, I, I noticed things about the hygiene habits. As soon as he got to school, he got a bath. He got three baths a day at school. And why is that happening? Well, because there isn't air conditioning. And if you don't give them baths um, several times a day, they develop little bumps on them. It, it's just so much that I, I gained from that experience. But also I have a really interesting, and, and if I could share my screen, I could share a picture of it. I went to um, one of the events, and I decided to take him there, was one where they were showcasing the work of children. And the children 
loved him. They ran to him. There was one little girl who held him all night, stood right by me while I took pictures. And um, I even have, so I went to the Instagram page for the group that I went to observe. And in the picture they took of the audience, there we are. I'm there with the camera and she's there holding my son. So those are the way that the children um, interact with with smaller children and they were fascinated the kids wanted to come and talk to me share with me about their experience because they he was the gateway for that i noticed it, it just opened up a whole nother world that i would not have seen and made interactions different people are very friendly there i don't know how they're surviving in COVID. everyone is touching your kid everyone is hugging them everyone's kissing them and at first i was like don't you touch my kid but afterwards i was like okay you know Hello. So in short, I think it was a really crazy idea that just so happened to work out. And I do feel that Fulbright is supportive of families, um, of families traveling. And okay. I, I Go do ahead. have that pulled up. If, if you would like to yeah, see that, absolutely. this is from a presentation yeah. that I did with, um, at an elementary school. So this is a picture that they took from the stage. And um, this is the um, quad quadrille that the children are performing. And if you go in closer and look to the side, you'll see there I am with the camera and there's the, the little girl holding my son. I'm, we're standing behind them. So that's something from my experience. Wow. That's pretty neat. That is pretty neat. Yeah. Um, Dr. Brown, did, did you did you take uh, any family, anybody with you on um, both both Fulbright's uh, no. experiences? No, I didn't. Uh, but, I, but I will say this, though. Um, the university was extremely accommodating. And, and that's one of the things that I can't say enough about, whether it was Fulbright or the host university. Uh, the host university said, hey, we have apartments here on campus. If you'd like to live on campus, just tell us what your needs are. Um, they volunteered a faculty member to go check out apartments around town for me. They volunteered to pay the security deposit for me. I mean, it was absolutely unreal. So when Dr. Batista is talking about a welcoming environment, my goodness, uh, from, as I said, looking at apartments for me and video chatting to show me what they, what they think about it to paying for my security deposit, it was unreal. Uh, so both Fulbright and the university were, were fantastic. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all. I do have an additional question. Um, can you talk about the food and how the culture surrounding mealtimes influenced your experience? Uh, Dr. Brown is laughing, so I have to hear what he's, he's got to say. <laughs> uh, no, I, I yield to you. I need to collect my thoughts on that one. That, that's a great question. Boy, I, I was set up, but we'll get to that later. <laughs> I, I noticed a lot of similarities about um, the culture surrounding mealtimes. Um, some when uh, most people were working, so they might pick up something on the run. There were meetings that were held over meals, like we'll go for coffee and we'll talk. In the morning, uh, I noticed in the morning, they were very careful about setting the place to eat and the same thing at dinner time. Um, when it, so it, it, I didn't really notice very much of a difference there. I, and for instance, the, the festival that I just showed you, same thing here, there's food associated with it, certain things you eat. Um, then just like for Thanksgiving or for Christmas, certain things you eat around those times. The, um, the food itself, I'm from Louisiana, and so there is this, uh, I've found that there are some similarities between Louisiana and sometimes throughout the, the Caribbean, and it's certainly there in South America. So they have something called feijoada, which is almost just like red beans and rice to me. But there were some things that were really different, and I had to get used to it. I'm like, you know, I tried that. I don't think so, but thank you for offering. Um, but I knew that I was at home when I went to a restaurant and there was Louisiana hot sauce on the table. So I was good then. So it, it, was, um, it, it wasn't as much of a shock as it may have been in, in, a, in another place. 
Okay. That was pretty good. Um, I think when, when I kind of thought back about the question immediately, I started laughing for several reasons, but um, that much of an issue because you had a lot of Bosnian influence, uh, which means that, you know, pork was, was not even on the table with all puns intended. Um, but there were some things, um, I don't know if any of you have tried the horseradish root, um, just like literally straight out of the ground. Um, it was part of our Sunday dinner one time and it felt like my nose had exploded um, because I was not aware and they told me after they wanted to see if I was actually going to eat it. Uh, and so I did and I never ate it again. Um, there were also some other things that were, um, that were very interesting, but, but I really appreciate it uh, and so far because it taught me a lot about the history and thinking about how food was so closely tied to their former relationship with Yugoslavia uh, and thinking about the ways in which many households made the best of what they had, particularly in those times. And so when food wasn't prevalent, they would eat um, other things that you may not consider uh, to be meal appropriate. And, you know, again, I'm just talking about horseradish and other things, but it was a really eye-opening experience for me. Um, some things I won't eat again, but I did it once so I can please everyone and please myself. But uh, it, it was hilarious. Some days I just wondered, wow, what did I get myself into? But a great experience overall. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in about that difference in the food. The first night there, we ordered pizza and they said, yes, you should try the Portuguese pizza. That'll be interesting. We shouldn't have tried the Portuguese pizza. It was, I don't know what kind of sauce there was. There was some boiled eggs and ham on it. I'm like, this is not pizza. This is something else. But then they also um, introduced me to something called tapioca. And it's a tapioca starch that you make. Um, it, it turns out like a burrito sort of thing. And I can't even get it in the US. So I have to order it from Amazon. And I make that sometimes here. So there are some things that I really liked and some things, yeah, I don't have to do that again in life. Yeah, uh, I, I've got one to top it all, a hot horse sandwich. Yeah, yeah, it was on the menu. Um, we went to a restaurant immediately when I landed and I saw a horse on the menu. And so I just leaned over to say, is this really what I think it is? And it was affirmed to me that it was. I said, great, I will have the margarita pizza. And so, um, you know, I made the best of it. But again, it was a very interesting learning opportunity. And for five euros, you too can have a hot horse sandwich on a Sunday. Let's see. Yeah. Here's a question for you, Dr. Batiste, what I'm thinking, can you go a little further insofar as any sort of culture shock beyond food? What else stood out to you in your experiences that were completely different from your own? Um, I, um, one thing that was a little difficult to adjust to at first is the lack of central air inside in Brazil is like two skips away from the equator. And it was, it, it was difficult. Um, and it really made me have to adjust my lifestyle. Also, there was not a washer in the house. So I had to wash everything by hand. And I had a child who was getting three baths a day at school. So every morning I'm scrubbing clothes by hand and um, you know, the dishwasher, that's fine. That's no problem. But the washing machine and not having that and then learning how to hang things up to dry them, that was a bit of a shock for me. Um, in the US, there are um, certain regulations regarding walking pets and, and picking up after them. And those didn't exist to the same degree. But, um, and also the regulation of the sidewalks by the city or what have you, there would be some places where the sidewalk was just wide enough to fit a telephone pole. So you had to go into the street and then other places, like I, I actually fell on the sidewalk, but um, that was my fault that I just wasn't looking. I was looking at the surroundings. That, that part was good. That was just me. Um, that, that was a bit of a shock for me. Um, also, I'm not, I've, I haven't spent a lot of time in a large city. So just being in a large city, period, was different for me. Um, not having my own car, relying on public transportation, people living very close together. That's just that in general 
that would have been anywhere if it had been. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think, oh, there was also the community where, um, where I was doing some work. I was talking about the, um, how they use music as a form of social, uh, to, for, to fight for social justice. One day I went to the community and the Uber driver could not get me to the center because the roads were so messed up and there was sewage in the streets in a way that it would have been, I, I think it would have been criminal here. And um, a few weeks later, I went back and it was fixed. Well, when I came back, I was looking at news stories on Globo Play and I saw where the news had come and done a story and how they were using their group as um, the people who are associated with the group were using their influence to have things like that changed. Um, so that was, uh, that seeing that was a bit of a shock for me. Also, they're the very much of a, indoor outdoor feel to everything because there isn't as much central air a lot of times you'll go to a cafe and it's basically completely outside and i i mean I'm like more of the time than i would have expected uh, there's uh more of a there was more of a connection to nature um you know flies on the food ah, no big deal i mean it, it wasn't like there were herds of flies or things, but it wasn't as big a deal as if, you know, if a fly gets in your house, you're like, get it, somebody get it. They were like, let it live. <laughs> so it was, um, so it wasn't like a, it, it wasn't like a bad, good thing. It was just a difference. It was something that I had to come to understand and, um, and, and live, live with. And there were so, so many things that were the same here. Like there, oh, acai. Acai. I don't know if other places have acai, but you have got to try it. It's it's amazing. Um, there's one on every single corner there. Um, yeah. So um, maybe those are some of the things. Oh, that's great. That's great. I, mine again. I can't. I can't speak after you anymore. So I'm going to go in front of you because you're making me look bad here. But. I think um, one of the funny aspects here was just me learning their higher education system where students do not pay tuition uh, and I cannot assign them books. And so that's completely different from the model in which I come from. And so just imagine walking into an environment where they say, oh, hey, by the way, you can't assign books. So I'm thinking, what do I do then? And so anyway, it led to a very uh, interesting collaboration between myself, the department, and the copy machine. Um, because again, you couldn't assign anything. Their bookstores are nothing like ours whatsoever. Um, the one that they had at the university I was at was no larger than maybe a couple of bedrooms combined um, <laughs> was the size of their bookstore. Um, but I just think overall, um, the food quality was a lot better uh, because the EU standards for food are a lot higher than what they are here in the United States. And so you're getting, you know, a lot of organic, you're getting uh, food that doesn't have uh, artificial flavoring, saturated fats, amongst other things. So when you actually buy something, you're buying what you intend to buy minus a lot of the additives. So it, it's, it's always a helpful thing. Um, I second that food quality. Mm. Lots of fairs. Every neighborhood has its own fair, and they have fresh produce. It's it, that was amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, that's good. I, I found myself getting a, a a cart actually because there is a, a huge farmers market about a block from where I was staying, and every Saturday there were at least a few dozen vendors who had everything you can imagine. Uh, right there. And, and so it was absolutely amazing. And again, the prices were a lot lower. The cost of living was a lot lower. Uh, so my, my euro went a lot further than what it would here. Uh, but again, a lot of great experiences all together. And I think there is a question in the chat here. Um, so I'll take Miss Veronica's job for just a second, but don't worry, I'll give it back to you. Um, can you tell us about one thing that helped you to enjoy your stay? What kept you focused? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say for me, the realization that I only had this period of time to enjoy this experience and I needed to make the most of every minute. So that, that understanding really helped me 
stay focused and also the experience itself like when you see something and experience something you're like oh my gosh i want to learn more and then you get into that and then it opens up another world and just i i, I guess that's the love of learning i mean that that's probably what brought brought us here to this point um that because we love learning and i think that was really really big for me oh that's pretty good i mean for me it was just more so waking up every morning and looking out the window to see and to realize continuously that I'm in a different space. I'm in a different place altogether. And that was motivation enough because for me, I had a few other things I wanted to do. I wanted to travel over to, to Croatia and Italy. So travel was very big for me outside of the classroom. And that's what really kept me going in addition to everything else. Uh, I wanted to get out and see as much of that part of Europe as possible. And again, the cost of living was low, the train, was perfect, no car needed. Walking to the train station, you can feel free to go to Italy, Austria, Croatia, Serbia and beyond. And, and so for me, it really kept me engaged to think, where am I gonna go this weekend? What do I wanna do? And so, and of course, having students who are just as eager to learn about you as you are about them was also delightful as well. Yeah, the students were amazing. They had so many questions and they would, we had a WhatsApp group and they would send questions and they just kept me going and that the students really, yes. I have another question that came to me privately. Um, should applicants submit multiple applications? Huh. I have not experienced that. Um, typically, as I recall from the Fulbright Scholars application, you can select um, your primary institution that you would like to submit your application to as well as a secondary. Uh, and so I think that provides you an opportunity to kind of apply more than once, if you will, but completing two applications onto themselves, I'm not sure. I would not encourage it, um, but I don't, I don't have any familiarity with that because the application process sometimes is, is quite exhaustive for one, uh, let alone two. But Dr. Batiste, do you have any insight on that one? No, no, I, no, I don't have any insight. I'm sorry. Okay, and another question. Um, how does it feel to leave a community that you know could benefit more from your contribution and expertise? And was it heartbreaking? Mm -hmm. I, oh, uh, Dr. Brown. Oh, no, 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 please, after you. This is your show. I'm just oh. here as a backup singer. <laughs> oh, please. <laughs> um, I, I would say that I didn't really see, I, it, okay, so in the, the way that the world is now with access to technology, I never stopped communicating with the people in the community where I was. And also I really felt like I benefited more from being there and learning from them than they did from me. And for particularly the, the community where I was studying the music, the setting is so different. And they are, they, they weren't just, even though they had issues within their community, they're, they, like, tr they travel all over the world performing this music. The, the musicians that you see on Brazilian, The Voice, they're their friends, they're taking pictures with them. So I, I feel like I had so much more to learn from them and, um, I even tried taking lessons from them over WhatsApp. As far as the university was concerned, I did tear up a little bit, leaving them after we did the, the gospel concert. Um, not so much because I felt I had more to teach them, but because that, I don't know if, they, if there's a word for it, that synergy that occurs when there's this, um, when there is this, this connection where you're you're growing and you're learning and that is happening and having to leave from that and and not have that with them i i felt more connected with those students than i have with a group of students in a long time and that was heartbreaking now, another interesting tidbit is um when i was 
people outside of choral music really don't know his name, but I studied with and performed uh, with a group called the Moses Hogan Singers. And he is well known in the area of choral music. So when I went there, they were super excited. And I went to three different choral concerts and at each of them, they were performing his music. So they were excited. They wanted to learn more. They wanted to talk and um, they, they wanted me to send them extra sheet music and just, just having that environment that was a little sad to leave it that was heartbreaking yeah yeah i i would say um for me it's the second family that i gained that was very difficult to leave because we grew so close um you know they were in the midst of continuously their uh, continuing their education of slovene which was always comical um and, and just in addition to that just a close personal bonds that we we drew together and uh you know we still use WhatsApp um, often. I'm still in communication with other faculty members uh, from the department that hosted me a few years ago. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was sad. It was a very sad day when I boarded the plane to head back because I know that I, I was leaving folks who really cared about me, um, but also I was going back to the US where folks who also cared about me. So it was really kind of a bittersweet moment. Okay, and it looks like we have just a few minutes left. Um, so, um, Dr. Batiste, Dr. Brown, do you have any additional things that you want to share with us before we end? I did want to insert something about that leaving and the difficulty of leaving. Um, someone told me that once you get one, um, one grant, it's easier to get more. So when I came back to the university, I applied for a Global Catalyst grant to go back and study and to bring students and to collaborate with other academic areas and we were granted that. So now over the next several years, we're building an exchange program between the university and the students in the music program there. So even though it was sad leaving, I tried to look at opportunities to bring students there and for them to come here. So to keep that relationship going and for me to know that it wasn't gonna be the last time that I saw them. Yeah, the only thing I would really do is encourage everyone to give Fulbright more thought. If you haven't thought about it before, if you think it was out of your reaches or elements, it's really not. Take careful note of the descriptions under each category of each award because you'll notice that some don't require PhDs, some don't require a lot of the preconceived notions that many of us uh, otherwise assume tenured status or otherwise. The Fulbright is a great opportunity to travel the world. It can really do a lot of great work for your career, but as well as for you personally. And, and I think those are the really excellent combinations. Um, above and beyond that, if I can be of any assistance, please do let me know. Uh, and I would love to see all of you uh, as Fulbright recipients and Fulbright alums moving forward into the future. Well, let me jump in here and thank both of you very much for your time today and a very interesting uh, uh, and in enlightening conversation. And um, we will, we are planning to have other professional development opportunities on other subjects uh, as the year goes on. Uh, so stay tuned. Uh, Veronica will be getting the word out of other things we've got planned. Um, I think you all will find some of them very interesting, especially if, um, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be opportunities for everybody to engage in some topics. Um, let me just also put out to those of you who have uh, tuned in today, if you have got an area, um, some level of professional development, or an idea that you would like to run past us, we are looking for topics. Uh, we've got some planned, but there are obviously others, and you may have some expertise in an area that you know would be of uh, help and service to others in our community. Um, let us know, because we would be very much uh, interested in uh, hearing what you have to offer and seeing if there's something we can um, present. Uh, again, thank both of you very much for taking the time out to be with us today, and for all of you who tuned in. We appreciate it. Um, again, I've seen, I see so many names. I want to, I want to just say, stay on this call and let's, uh, let's have a quick conversation with all of you, but I'll, I'll pick another time to talk to all of you at some point. Um, again, thank everybody for your time today. And um, Veronica, anything else for the good of the cause? 
Um, just, rem just a reminder that we are recording this session and I noticed that we did have a little bit of a hiccup so I might have to go in and, and do just a little bit of editing. But this session as well as the first Fulbright session was recorded and we will get that out and available to you as soon as we can. And um, like I said, if you have any other topic ideas, things that you're interested in leading, you know, please let us know. Um, email us at doctoral.scholars at sreb.org, or you can send it to me directly, veronica.johnson at sreb.org. And with right. that, thank you for your time, and you have a, a great rest of today. Sounds like a plan. Hey, Amaris. <laughs>